Uh, okay, so here's your basic setup. And um, for the Paradise Egg, you really need to understand what's happening here and why and why you saw what you saw. Um, which which plate or plates did uh, lit up for you? Anybody want to venture a guess? Then all light up, right? When you shine, they all glow. So which ones? Which one or which ones glow? This one? Can you go? Yeah. So, um, oh, here, let me do this. You can see a little better. One sec. I'll, uh, I'll move this image up so you can see it a little better. Okay. Okay, so yeah, this one, this one is the, the, the plus P glow, LB amp R. That's the only one that glowed. So let's run through why that was. First off, just kind of labeling this LB, that is the uh, the nutrients. So that's that's why LB is in all the petri dishes, because you gotta have something for the bacteria to grow on. Then you had AMP. AMP stood for the antibiotic, ampicillin. Ara, Ara stood for the sugar arabinose. Um, now the purpose of the antibiotic is to select for the plasmid. Okay, so let me review what the plasmid was. Your plasmid, it had three genes, so I want you to know those three genes. Um, so one of those genes was um, it coded for beta lactamase. So beta lactamase uh, gives you the resistance to the antibiotic. So I'll just say AB for antibiotic, okay? The, uh, the second gene on the, uh, the plasmid, I'm actually gonna make this all part of one thing because it's all part of the arabinose operon. So you have the arabinose operon, where in the arabinose operon, you had the arabinose genes, the genes that would, you would use to break down the arabinose sugar. But then most importantly for, uh, for why they glowed was the P-glow gene the gene that we got from the jellyfish that made them glow. So here's the story. Um, this plasmid, you want, to, you want to select for the bacteria that took up this plasmid, right? So that is the purpose of the ampicillin. That's why I said it's used to select for the plasmid. Because think about it. Antibiotics kill bacteria. But if you took up the plasmid that has the gene for beta-lactamase, you can survive the antibiotic. So in other words, on this uh, on this this plate here, you should have growth. On this plate here, you should have growth. And uh, on this plate here, you should have growth. Not growth, growth. So understand why this plate right here, you had no growth. That's really important to understand. There's no growth because there is the ampicillin and there is, it's minus for the P glow. Because it doesn't have, minus P glow means it did not get the plasmid that has the antibiotic resistant gene on there, okay? So that's how we selected for uh, um, just the bacteria that have P glow. And also within these Petri dishes, there could have been some bacteria on here that did not receive the plasmid, you know, just by chance. So that's another thing is we wanna select for just the bacteria on those petri dishes that receive the plasmid, okay? All right, um, let's talk about the arabinose. So um, the arabinose, this is the on-off switch, okay? So here's the, uh, here's the concept. The reason why the p -glow gene and the arabinose gene are part of the same operon is you have to have a way to turn on the p -glow gene. Because think about it, if I give a bacteria the P-glow gene, that doesn't mean the bacteria is going to express the P-glow gene and glow. You gotta find a way to tell the bacteria to use that gene. That's why you attach, that's why you, the, 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 the lab we ordered it from, 
That's why they attach the P-GLO gene to be part of the same operon. Remember, operon is a collection of genes that work together. The same operon, the same collection of genes that break down the arabino sugar. That way, when you grow the bacteria on the uh, petri dish that has the arabino sugar, that's then going to tell the bacteria, hey, I got to use the arabinose operon to break down the sugar. And then part of that is, it's like you sneaking, I don't know if you've ever gone through like a, um, like a gated community or something. You're like, I don't know the gate code. You just kind of like slide in behind the, uh, the other car. That's what P-GLO is doing, right? P-GLO, the bacteria isn't trying to um, uh, use the P-GLO. It's just trying to break down the arabidose. But because uh, the scientists put the P-GLO gene on the same uh, promoter as the other uh, uh, arabidose operon, that's why it also gets expressed. So only the P-GLO, you had a P-GLO, LB, AMP, ARA. This is the only one that glowed. Okay? This one didn't glow even though it had the P-GLO gene because you don't have the arabinose on the Petri dish. Okay? Any questions about that? That's really about it. There isn't really much more um, that I would ask you about. That's, that's basically it. So if this makes sense to you, then... Uh, at least for this lab, you got the the uh, the gel electrophoresis lab. You got to go over again. This is the main thing to understand for that. Okay. All right. So let's talk about evolution of populations. So a very common misconception with evolution is that, um, and it's it's something that's obvious. Like I think when I I or somebody says it, but if you're confronted with a test question about it, people tend to get it wrong. And it's that populations evolve, not individuals. Think about it. Let's say um, I'm a finch and I'm on the Galapagos Islands and I get plopped down there and I'm like, oh my gosh, only thing that there are here is these big giant seeds and I don't have a big old beak. It'd be nice if I had a big old beak. Let me just create a big beak so I can eat these seeds. It doesn't work that way. Right? If I don't have the big beak, I'm just going to die, right? Or I'm going to at least have few, or I'm not going to survive as long. So I have fewer um, offspring, so my genes for my small beak are not going to be passed on in the population as much. That is why populations evolve. Okay? Think back to Hardy Weinberg, right? You got to think of evolution now, not just as change over time, but the change in allele frequencies over time. So the change in like the, the percentages of different alleles in a population over time. Um, uh, point two here. Evolution doesn't have a direction, so um, you know, evolu like it's just kind of more of like a, something to keep in mind. Like no, like, no organism is trying to do anything; they're just trying to survive and reproduce. So, um, what could be an adaptation on one island for a finch may not be an adaptation on a different island. Um, and then the uh, third thing here is fitness. Now, when we say fitness in everyday life, we're kind of talking about like strength and maybe speed. And fitness in um, biology, it isn't quite that. It's your ability to survive and reproduce. That's what we mean by fitness in biology. So you'll hear, you'll hear somebody, uh, you know, people say like, oh, this organism is more fit than that organism. And what they're saying is that organism is, is, that organism is more uh, likely to survive and reproduce than a different organism. Okay, um, talking about populations. So Make sure you kind of understand that definition. The definition of populations in biology is actually pretty similar to our common day definition. Like when you see the population sign for McLean, um, it's not counting the number of humans and birds and cats and dogs. It's just the number of people. So in biology, the population is just referring to the number of a certain species. Now, what is a species? It's, it's referring to uh, individuals that can breed with one another and then produce offsprings that can also breed. So populations, interbreeding individuals that live in the same place at the same time. And keyword is same time. You don't count population by like things that used to live there. And again, populations evolve over many generations as they compete for resources, not like in any one generation. So over the course of generations, you're going to get the long necks. This, this, you don't just like all of a sudden in one generation get giraffes with super long necks. It doesn't work that way. And remember, um, one, of the, the, one of the key things you need for evolution is competition. If there is not a competition for limited resources, there is no adapt there's no such thing as an adaptation then. 
right? Adaptation is something that allows you to better compete and thus better survive and more likely reproduce than some other organism. So if there's no competition, there's not limited resources, there's not gonna be any selection pressure. Okay, um, we're gonna talk about single gene and polygenic traits. Um, but kind of more broadly speaking, again, natural selection, it's, it's working on, um, they say the, the organismal level, meaning um, yes, natural selection will change the frequency of certain genes, but what actually, it's all about how does this overall organism survive and reproduce? Meaning, um, like going back to the finch example, what really made the finches better survive and reproduce was the shape of their beaks. The color of the finches, that really didn't matter as much in terms of like whether the finch survives and reproduces. So evolution wouldn't really work upon those genes. Um, and then uh, thinking back to this like kind of gene pool idea that all of the organisms in a population, they're, they're contributing all the different alleles of all of their genes across their genome to the overall gene pool. Um, all right, so we'll talk about single gene and polygenic traits. So really make sure you understand how to interpret a graph for a single gene uh, trait versus a graph for a polygenic trait. So single gene, and uh, when I say single gene, you know, like think of your like mono hybrid Punnett square, you know, where you could be like, um, you could have a dominant allele or you could have a recessive allele. Um, you know, so in other words, when you have a, a single gene trait, there's two options, dominant, recessive. So when you have a graph of, a, of the phenotypes, phenotypes are what you look like, you have two options. You got widow's peak or you don't have widow's peak. So then contrast that with polygenic. Polygenic, because you're controlled by multiple genes, you end up having multiple options. So for example, height. There is not two options in this world for height. You're not either tall or short. You are a variation, a gradation of height. Now understand why that is, why that is polygenic, because there are many genes that control height. You could be homozygous dominant, let's say, for one of the genes that controls height, but then maybe you're heterozygous for the second gene, and then maybe you're homozygous recessive for the third gene that controls height, and then maybe you're, you know, whatever, you make up the letters, and let's say to be like, here, like you are like 710, you have to be like homozygous dominant for all, let's say 10 genes that control height, that would get you here. And then maybe to be here, you're homozygous recessive for all the other genes that control height. But because you have all these options to be heterozygous across all those genes that control height, that's why you end up having these like different um, uh, phenotypes for height. Okay, so hopefully that makes same thing with like skin color. There's not just one gene that controls skin color. That's why like uh, we, we kind of have a lot of different shadings of skin color. Okay. Um, so talking about polygenic traits, there are, there are different kinds of selections that you'll see. So like what they'll do is they'll show you a population and they either will show you a graph and ask what kind of selection has this population undergone or they'll describe a scenario for you and be like, is this scenario um, stabilizing selection or some other kind of selection? So in stabilizing selection, what happens is the uh, intermediate phenotypes, the phenotypes that are in the middle, are going to be uh, favored. So the classic example is birth weight. So think about it. If you're an infant and you have a super low birth weight, right, that would mean you're premature your percentage, your chances of surviving are going to be much lower than if you're going to be more at like an intermediate birth weight. And then same would be true for if you're like a really, really heavy offspring, you're less likely to survive. And like uh, the mother is, you know, the mother's body is not going to like, there's no reason for, uh, for a woman to keep like carrying a baby past the point she needs to, right? Because if the baby's bigger, that's just more difficult for pregnancy, right? So why would, you, why would a female hold a baby for longer than she needs to would be the idea. Um, so anyways, the, uh, the intermediate birth weights are going to be selected for. The ones that like the baby has, has developed, you know, just as long as it needs to, but no longer, right? Like we can let it grow outside of, uh, of the womb. 
Okay, so that's stabilizing selection. Then you have what's called directional selection. So on directional selection, one of the extremes is selected for. Okay? So what happens is over time, your, um, your standard bell curve graph will shift to the right. So this dashed line, that represents you know, your standard bell curve. But here, the, uh, the rightmost extreme, in this case, it's beak size. So the bigger beak size is being selected for in this environment. So over time, the average is going to shift to the right because the bigger beaks are being selected for. Okay. Um, so question would be like, maybe they present you with a scenario. Hey, on an island, the average size of the seeds have increased. You know, and so you notice that the beaks have increased as well. The size of the beaks have increased so that that would give those birds better fitness. They can survive better, reproduce more. What kind of selection has occurred? That would be directional selection because only the, uh, the, the extremely large beaks are being selected for. Okay. Now then, you know, if you're thinking, you're like, well, there could be another scenario where what if the two extremes, not the middle, is being selected for. That's called disruptive selection. And I think the names kind of make some sense. Like directional selection, the direction is shifting. Stabilizing selection, like when you think of being like stable, I think for a lot of issues in life, sometimes the middle tends to be like the, the sweet spot. If you're being disruptive, you're like hollowing out the middle, right? Like you know, having no, like having two extremes is not stable for, in a lot of different scenarios. In, a, in a, a evolution, if you have a disruptive selection in a population, the extremes are being favored. So for example, if we're looking at, um, let's say on an island, you only have large and small seeds. If I'm a bird with like an average size beak, you might think that sounds pretty cool you know, uh, but it's actually, that would not favor you because you would neither be able to outcompete the birds that have the big beaks for the large seeds, nor can you outcompete the birds that have the really small beaks, uh, beaks for the smaller seeds. It's kind of like, uh, there's a saying, you could be a jack of all trades, but a master of none. You know, it's like, you're, you're not really specialized in anything. That's what's going on here. If you're not specialized, you're not going to survive. So over time, again, the dash line is the old uh, graph. Over time, the, the middle hollows out. It favors one or the other. Okay. Oh, in tennis, uh, I used to coach tennis even though I know nothing about it. Um, other than in tennis, they say either you play at the net or you play back. You don't want to be caught in no man's land where you're like hovering around the middle because it's like, what are you doing? You got to commit to a strategy. Right? If you're hovering around the middle, they could just smash it on you at the net, or they could just like hit it over your head and just like, you know, make it land like right behind you. So you gotta pick a strategy. That's what's going on in disruptive selection. Okay, uh, moving on. So uh, talking about some other sources of evolution, um, uh, and we've kind of talked about this slide already, but I think it's, it's useful to look at another example. Uh, insecticides. So maybe in, in apes, you talked about this where when you use an insecticide to kill off insects, let's say these are beetles. Beetles. You use an insecticide to kill the beetles that are eating the crops. What's gonna happen is because not all the beetles in a population are the same, there's variation among beetles. By chance, you might get one of those beetles or eventually you will get one of those beetles that's gonna be resistant to that insecticide, okay? And what's going to happen is that beetle is going to survive the antibiotic, or not the, antibiotic, the insecticide, and, but the same principle for antibiotic resistance. And this beetle is then going to um, uh, populate and keep surviving and keep reproducing. So over time, the frequency of alleles that allows you to survive the insecticide is going to increase in the population. What's the solution to this? You know, you know, it's like a, it's like a common like agricultural best practices that, that they do. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, you can use some natural methods. Uh, but like, what if like, just assuming we're just gonna be using insecticides, like I, you know, for whatever reason, I don't wanna use a natural method. I just wanna use, I just wanna use, I just wanna use chemicals, okay? Um, consider sports, you know, what if uh, the team, the defense just keeps figuring it out, you keep doing the same play, the defense keeps stopping you, what do you do? 
What do you do? You do something new, right? Like you don't keep running your head against the wall, right? You don't do like if you're developing insecticide resistant bugs, well then stop using the same insecticide. You gotta switch it up a little bit. And that's what they'll do, right? They're gonna they don't always they'll switch up which insecticides they use so that you're not gonna keep selecting for any one um, variation of uh, of insect. Uh, a similar thing happened with like um, it happens with like HIV AIDS, like that virus, like um, they, when it first, they first came up with the medicine, the medicine would, uh, they had one medicine and it killed off the virus, but that virus mutates so quickly that eventually they would get, um, that the individuals would get, uh, one of the viruses that could, um, evade the medicine and then it would propagate in their body. And so what they ended up doing is they use a cocktail of medicine. So they'll use a bunch of different medicines that way, um, uh, you know, the combination of them, the odds are it's very difficult for a virus to like evade four different treatments of medicine. But even then, like if given enough time, the virus can keep like evading uh, even like a cocktail of different medicines. Yeah, great. So for the insecticide, um, like, like if you change it, do they like cycle through? Or do they the idea would be that you like cycle through. I'm not sure how frequently they do it, but that's the idea. Like, you know what? The idea is don't keep using the same thing because eventually they're gonna like, the, the insects are gonna, um, that population gonna evolve resistance to it. Okay, moving on, um, speciation. So speciation, that's a, just a vocab saying there's a new species that's come about. Well, that begs the question, what is a species? And within the world of biology, actually, it's actually kind of a complicated, it's a controversial thing to say, right? You know, if you're like at a biology party and you're like, Hey guys, define species. People, it might get heated in there. The most commonly expect, uh, accepted definition is called the biological species definition. And that's technically what this definition is. And it's the one I think that makes the most common sense. And it, and it says that, hey, what makes like us a species and we're different from say that tree or something else is we can breed with one another and we generally look alike and this is key we produce two things fertile or really one thing fertile offspring or two two like things about it fertile is really important why we don't just produce offspring we produce fertile offspring and if i reproduce with a plant and i make an offspring that offspring has to be fertile it's key because otherwise the line stops there right so species and they have to produce fertile offspring anyways um and then as time goes on you know um and species become reproductively isolated from each other so they can't reproduce one another anymore you then are going to keep getting newer and newer um, species so you know that's the idea right you have a common ancestor these all uh these four cat things share a common ancestor but then over time because they are reproductively isolated from each other the genetic variations will accumulate enough where they can no longer reproduce with each other and produce offspring that can also reproduce um, and make new offspring. Yeah. So, uh, like, I know like, certainly there's different like, organisms that they can interbreed and produce fertile offspring that all of them look alike. So is that considered a subspecies? Look alike isn't really that important. Yeah. Um, like, oh, you're saying subspecies? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I guess you could say subspecies. Um, I think you kind of get into a little bit of a gray area with that, where it's like, once you get into subspecies, but, um, yeah, lookalike is kind of vague, you know, the important thing really is interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Like that's kind of the objective standard typically for like what makes something a species. Okay. All right. So we want to talk about now, um, pre-zygotic and post-zygotic barriers. So essentially, what are things that are going to prevent, um, what are things that contribute to speciation? So pre means before, post means after. Zygotic is referring to a zygote. So this is a zygote. A zygote is um, what happens when a sperm successively fertilizes an egg. And before the egg has divided. As soon as this egg divides, you know, we then have like different names for like when it's like a two cell embryo and four cell and so on. So a zygote is technically just when it's just like a one cell sperm and egg. So prezygotic barriers, they are barriers that prevent the sperm from fer fertilizing the egg. What things exist in nature that prevent sperm from getting to the egg? That's prezygotic. 
Postzygotic is, all right, once the sperm has fertilized the egg, what is going to prevent that egg from developing into a fully formed and fertile offspring? So let's go through those. First prezygotic barrier is called temporal isolation. Fortunately, these names, they kind of tell you what they do. Temporal isolation, temporal is time. So temporal isolation, the idea would be, hey, these two frogs, they would be more than happy to, to get with one another, right? Like they're all game for it. There's one issue. They breed at different times of the year, right? This frog breeds from January to March. And, um, you know, if it's like, hey, what's going on? We should have babies. This frog, and it's August, this frog's going to be like, ah, sorry, it's, uh, it's August. I'm not, I don't do that during August. And it's like, ah, bummer. I guess I'm going to go find another frog. Like, I'm going to go on Tinder now, I guess. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> geographic isolation. Um, you may have heard the song, Ain't No Mountain High Enough. River wide enough, yada, yada, yada. Um, well, it turns out there is. Geographic isolation says um, there is actually physical barriers that prevent offspring, uh, offspring organisms from interbreeding with each other. Um, so uh, a good example would be the uh, Isthmus of Panama. Um, so this, this uh, formation arose about three and a half million years ago. And so when that, that formation arose, it then separated this population of fish from that population of fish. Meaning like four million years ago, this wasn't there. So these two fish populations, they could just breed with one another and it was totally cool. But then once that land formation uh, arose, they no longer can get with one another. So over time, they're gonna evolve. They evolved to look like two different species of fish. All right, um, third kind of prezygotic isolation is ecological isolation. Now, this one is really, really easy to confuse with geographical isolation. So make sure you, you kind of understand. It's, a, it's kind of a subtle difference. Ecological isolation is um, they're in the, uh, the same region. So they're not like completely isolated. Like they're not technically isolated by like a mountain, but they operate different habitats. So for example, the mountain bluebird would be more than happy to breed with the eastern bluebird. bluebird. They would love that. The issue is mountain bluebird's at a high elevation, eastern bluebird is at a low elevation. You know? It's like you might you would be you might be perfectly happy dating someone in like Maryland, but it's like, why? You know, like, why go that? Like, why would I do that? You know, it isn't like, there's not technically something like, there's not like an Atlantic ocean preventing you from getting to them, but it's just like, it's just not very convenient. So statistically, it is less likely for the mountain bluebird and the Eastern bluebird, bluebird to exchange genes. So over time, their allele frequencies are gonna change. So evolution happens. Okay. Um, and this is my personal favorite, behavioral isolation. So, there is honestly something called the blue-footed booby and another organism called the masked booby. Actual bird names. And here's the deal. The blue-footed booby, they do like this. They're like, look at my feet. I got, I got blue feet. Let's have babies or something. I don't know. That's what they do. They're like, they like go up to each other, I guess, and show off their feet and do a big dance. They go to the clubs and do like a nice dance and like, you know, they're like, wow, we should have babies. That's a nice, those are some nice feet. And then, but the mass booby could care less, right? Is not entertained at all about whatever the blue footed booby is doing. They could breed together, right? There's like, technically there isn't anything preventing them from having babies together. It's just the mass booby is like, I'm not into that, right? I like whatever this, this thing's doing here, right? I'm a fan of that, whatever this is, right? They have a different courtship ritual, you know, a different little, uh, um, you know, I don't know how to elaborate more than that, you know, different way of wooing the, uh, the opposite sex to have offspring. So there you go. Um, uh, last prezygotic one is called mechanical isolation. And this is definitely the saddest of all. This is really sad. These two snails would love to have babies with one another. 
be ecstatic for it. The issue is the shells just don't line up, right? They just mechanically, mechanicalized, it's just the parts can't, can't work together. They just, the shells are spiraling the wrong way for breeding to happen. Awful, awful story. It's like the notebook part two, you know, it's just. <laughs> uh, anyways, okay, so here's a slide um, summarizing it. Another example of mechanical isolation would be like a gigantic dog and a really small dog. Technically, there's nothing, like if you were to like take the sperm from or, or egg from this tiny dog and the sperm or egg from that bigger dog, you can, you can make them, um, uh, the, the, the sperm fertilize that egg. It's just very difficult for that logistically to happen uh, in mechanical isolation. So, okay, um, moving on to post-zygotic. So, all right, cool, the sperm fertilize the egg. Somehow, they're two separate species, but hey, they didn't care. Like, love found a way, two separate species, love found a way, and they, and they fertilize an egg together, right? Now, what is preventing them from having fertile offspring are uh, one of three things. One is hybrid inviability. So hybrid inviability would be this. Let's say you have two species of frogs that get together and they have some, a baby tadpole. The issue is this hybrid tadpole, hybrid is a thing of like a hybrid car, gas and electric. Hybrid is referring to like one species, another species having an offspring, okay? This tadpole, it cannot develop into a reproductively mature frog. So it, it just can't get there to like get mature enough to be able to have offspring, okay? Now hybrid infertility is a little further on down the road. So these are going in order of like how far they get. Hybrid infertility would be a donkey. So uh, I don't know if you know this, or not donkeys, mules. Uh, mules come from the breeding of the horse, a species, and a donkey, another species, and they make a mule, a hybrid. Now, mules are not considered, like horses and donkeys are still considered separate species because mules are sterile. Mules cannot have their own offspring, okay? And then the last one, and hybrid breakdown is a little more controversial. This one is even further down the line, but what happens in hybrid breakdown, two different species get together, they, they fertilize an egg, that egg grows up, and here's the crazy thing. The hybrids, the first generation, the first gen of those, uh, of those hybrids, they're fertile. They can have offspring no problem, but what's interesting is the F2 generation, they cannot have offspring. So that's why we, 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 don't, we still consider them separate species. The parent generation, we consider them two separate species, okay? Any questions about that? These ones are a little less obvious and they're a little more difficult, but we're good. All right, moving on to coevolution. So coevolution is kind of fascinating. So co means like you're together. Coevolution is different species that don't breed with one another will evolve with each other. So here's an example of three different species. This uh, bird here, this butterfly, and this monarch, those three separate species will uh, evolve together. Because here's the story. This bird, birds want to eat butterflies. What a monster. This bird, for whatever, God, God knows why, eats the butterfly. But here's the deal. The bird does not want to eat the monarch. So if I'm a butterfly, I'm a sly butterfly. If I'm a butterfly, and I'm, a, and I'm in a population of butterflies, and just by chance... I happen to look more like a monarch, I am more likely to survive and reproduce than if I'm a butterfly that stands out more than a monarch, okay? So over time, the frequency of alleles that make the uh, butterfly population look like monarchs will increase. But then what's gonna happen is this bird is gonna start eating monarchs and be like, this is disgusting, I am disgusted. So if you're a bird that can't tell the difference between monarchs and butterflies, you're less likely to eat as much and reproduce as much. So over time, your lack of eyesight or judgment or whatever it is that prevents you from being able to tell the difference between a butterfly and a monarch, 
your genes will not be put into the population. But the birds that are, that are more sly, that can recognize the between monarchs and butterflies better, they will predominate. So then what will then happen is the butterflies, the butterflies that will look even more similar to monarchs will become more similar in the population and so on. And then with the monarchs, monarchs don't want to be eaten. So the, the monarchs in the monarch population that don't look like the butterflies, they are less likely to be eaten, so they will survive. So over time, the monarchs will look less like the butterflies, but the butterflies will look like the monarchs, and the birds don't eat the monarchs, and you kind of get the complication here. It's a complicated love triangle of sorts, if I could say that. Um, so there you go. All right, um, moving on to convergent evolution. Convergent evolution is very interesting. So convergent evolution, if you, I don't know if you ever noticed this, but you look at like the shadfish and the dolphin, and the ichthyosaur, the ichthyosaur, and the puffin, they all have very sleek, streamlined bodies. And you're like, huh, why would they have that? Well, that's just good for life underwater. Right? I can swim faster if I don't have as much like water or even air resistance hitting my body. So that trait, that uh, that trait to be uh, have a sleek body design, that has been a uh, that's been we call that convergent evolution because. Different organisms, different species that aren't closely related in evolutionary time develop similar adaptations because they occupy the same environment or similar environments. Okay? So not actually closely related, but they have similar adaptations. All right, then divergent evolution. And this is also called adaptive radiation. It's on the slide right here, but it's kind of hidden down there. So make sure you make that note. Uh, essentially synonyms. Adaptive radiation, um, it's basically what happens with Dar Darwin's finches. The idea would be you had one like ancestral species that had like, you know, your basic bird, right? Basic bird beak. But then over time, because like the, the, the there's a lot of different variety of food, you over time will get many different variations um, a radiation, if you will, of different uh, uh, variations of beak size because there's a bunch of different kinds of seeds. Okay, but they all what you would share kind of a again a basic bird beak design. All right, almost there. Genetic drift. Um, we've talked about genetic drift before. It's more of a reminder. Genetic drift is like if I flip a coin ten times, I should get five heads and five tails. But I just might not, just because, you know, small sample size. Genetic drift is essentially saying if you get a small sample size, you know, if you look at this population here, you know, and look at like the percentage of just black um, beetles here. Let's say I then take four random beetles. There's a chance that I could get here 50% of these beetles are black. That's not what it was here. The allele frequency, if you can use the, the vocab, is not the, uh, here is 50% for black, but it's not 50% here. That's not because of any sort of selective pressure. Natural selection didn't cause this to become 50%, just small sample size caused that. Because you could take another four beetles and just by a chance 0% of them are black. That doesn't mean there's 0% there's black in the original population though. It's just a small sample size. Okay. Um, understand the sources of genetic variation. We've also talked about this before, so it's a little bit more of a reminder. You could get genetic variation from a duplication event. Idea of duplication is, um, think of like the, the females like who have like two X chromosomes. You only need one functional X chromosome. So this other X chromosome, it can undergo changes and that doesn't actually prevent the female from surviving. A similar thing happens in gene duplication. The organism would only need one of these copies of B, so the other copy of B would be free to do evolution and mutate and change and make new alleles without it affecting the organism. There's also um, uh, mutations, genetic shuffling, so crossing over. That would create a, um, uh, you know, shuffling up the genes gives you some variation. Independent assortment, meaning um, which copy of the gene you get from mom or dad. You know, those don't, the genes from dad don't always all travel together. Those get uh, uh, randomly put into the, um, the gametes. Random fertilization. You don't know which sperm is going to get to which egg. 
and then migration of individuals into or out of population. So populations will change when uh, immigration or emigration happens. All right, uh, bottleneck effect. We kind of talked about the bottleneck on genetic drift. Bottleneck is an example of genetic drift. So here's the idea. Let's say these beans here represent the red and yellow alleles. So like dominant and recessive alleles in a population. But let's say some sort of chance event like uh, an asteroid hits Earth and causes there to be a drastic reduction, a bottleneck in the population. So you then get this small population here. This small population, it may not have the same frequency of red and yellow alleles as the original parent population. So again, it's very similar, basically the same thing as what's going on here. Similar idea. Um, now, related to a, a, a genetic bottleneck, in fact, an example, a type of genetic bottleneck is what's called a, the founder's effect. The founder's effect is um, something I've already described, but it's going to put the name to it. Founder's effect is you have an initial bigger population. By chance, for whatever reason, these three break off. These three beetles get broken off from the initial population. This population, it has twice as many um, uh, black, uh, red, red spotted as orange spotted. Not because the original population had that, but just by chance. So then the new population has less genetic variation here than the initial population. But again, just because of just a, a random kind of genetic drift type of thing. Just a small sample size caused that. Okay. Okay. I know that's kind of a lot. Let me stop the recording.